Thank you, and welcome everyone again to the first ever EPIC Summer Institute. We'll be focusing on course design for this entire week, and so we get you ready for the fall, to teach in the fall and ready for the academic year. My name is Lisa Felipe. I am the EPIC director and one of your organizers today, and we'll go through the introductions in just a minute. But first, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. Next slide, please. The EPIC program and UCLA acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino, Tongva, and Kech peoples. Thank you. Next slide. And I see that we have folks coming in. I just want to wait until they're right in the room. For those of you who are just joining us, good morning and welcome. We are just starting with our nuts and bolts for this morning, and you should have a, a link there on the chat with the participant guide for agenda for this session. Thank you and welcome. Happy Tuesday. Just a reminder, again, the session will be recorded for the benefit of the cohort. Feel free to access this in our Brew and Learn site, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And each of the recordings will be available at the end of the day. And so you'll be able to review if you'd like, or in case you miss a session, there's an emergency, you're able to view that as well. The other reminder is that we have enabled live English transcripts. And so if you would like to follow along and add captions or transcripts to your to the zoom feel free to click on the button at the bottom of your screen that says the live transcript and show the subtitles. If you have any questions, please do DM Christian one of our organizers for tech support. What we'll do today now is we'll take five minutes in a small group activity. And in those five minutes, what you'll do as a small group is to come up with one or two, if you're ambitious, one community learning agreement that we will kind of use as our code of conduct, right, for this entire institute. For those of you who do this exercise with your students, can you tell us what a learning community agreement is and how you go about asking your students or creating the learning community agreements with your students. Anyone have an example? I don't use it, but you know what? My kid's fifth grade teacher used it. Oh. I have twin boys and now they're in eighth grade, but one of their teacher in fifth grade actually created what they said like the rule of the class and the student would come up they had to come up with I think five because in fifth grade you don't want to have too many but they there were rules of how to behave in class things like you're not going to talk over your friends or your teacher or you're not going to stand up I mean our student wouldn't we're talking about fifth grade but I always thought it was great that I should implement that in my class but I haven't done it Plead guilty. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Well, we can we can talk about how you may incorporate that in your class as well. Elsa. I've been using it for the last two years, actually. I started with Zoom because I found it important, but I've continued using it in person now. And it's just, I usually do it in the second session, not the first session, because the first session we're dealing with formalities and some people will not come back. <laughs> for the second class so I try to sit down in the second session of any class and take the time to do the community agreements together it throws some students off so what I do is I offer some suggestions or some of some points that are important to me and offer them to the class as an example usually they need it to get started and then I will divide them as you said, as you're doing it now in small groups and ask them to think of three to five max. You wouldn't get much more rules and we bring them together. Usually they're pretty similar to each other and it's been working pretty well. What I've failed to do is 
to bring them up again during the quarter, but I haven't had problems, but I'd like to integrate it more into the rest of the quarter. Great, thank you, Elsa. And Chris? Okay, I'm gonna, this is my friend Ariel introduced in our anti-racism pedagogy introduced me to an article by Sensoy and D'Angelo. There we go. Boom. Beautiful. Um, I have the feeling that a lot of our students right now, they know what community agreements kind of is, and they sort of do it by rote. So this is a real good article that calls into question some of the community agreements that are supposed to, they actually protect offenders more than they protect the vulnerable people in there, like always assume the best intentions and things like that. So this article, which is a very short article, I highly recommend it. And again, thank you, Ariel, for bringing that to attention. I'm going to bring, I'm going to use this in all of my pedagogy seminars. Now we're going to complicate it, but I think the basic takeaway and correct me if you have a different opinion here ariel but the basic takeaway is for our students to become aware of their positionality when they hear and when they speak that that to especially for white students where white is invisible and they don't think that that inflects the way they hear other students talk or the way that they speak, to be able to create community agreements that say, be mindful of the position that you are occupying as you are hearing another person speak. Be mindful of the influences that have shaped the way that you are hearing what these people are saying, I think is, is a huge step in the right direction of getting students to become more aware that this community is not just people from invisible backgrounds or something. Those backgrounds very much need to be part of the conversation. So again, Ariel, thank you. And, and I strongly recommend you take a half hour to read through that and think about that as a way to encourage your students to, to think about their positionality as they come up with these agreements. Yeah, I think that was well said, Chris. I'll also just put in a couple, like I'm going to go back through the article right now and put, I'll put in some page numbers that are like particularly useful for, for this activity maybe. But yeah, well summarized. Thanks. Thank you, Chris and Ariel and all those who shared. And so I'm looking at the time and of course we're out of time because I want to give you as much break as possible, but we will come up with learning agreements. This is not something that we're going to take lightly because this is part of how we establish trust in our community for this week and how we establish some of the ground rules when it comes to sharing and giving feedback. And so what we'll do is at the beginning of your small, our small cohort meeting this afternoon, we'll start off with each of the cohorts coming up with two community agreements and then adding it to the participant guide. Though This welcome participant guide that Ariel shared at the top of the hour has space for you and each cohort will add their two community agreements there once they're done establishing them in their cohort sessions. And then what we'll do at the end as the organizers will compile them, combine some of the similar ones, edit them, and then post them up in our Room and Learn site so that we can be reminded of how we're going to be doing this entire week. Does that work for the organizers as well, Katie and Christian? Okay. Great. So we'll we'll talk about that during our oh thank you. We have some some prompts here for from from Chris. Thank you, Chris, and, and a few others. So thank you so much for, for the info and we'll come back to this room at 10 a.m. And we're going to start with our first session, which is backward design. All right. So we're gonna get started by looking at backward design. And if we could go to the next slide, just as a reminder about transcripts. So if you would benefit from those, we can drop the link. I've got a link in the chat right here where it gives you explicit instructions if that would help you. And also at the top of that participant guide, you'll also see a link you can click if you would like to follow along 
with the slides as well. So I'll get started just by going over our learning goals and outcomes for participants. So as we can see on the slides here, we're hoping that you'll be able to understand the backward design framework by the end of today, and also practice writing smart learning outcomes. And then our learning outcomes, which we have divided, you will see why in a second, this is part of our discussion today. We'll have you apply the principles of backward design when creating transparent learning outcomes for your students. And we'll have you practice aligning learning outcomes, assessments, and learning activities. And finally, we'll also have you create a backward design table to help you organize your course. Next slide. So just a, a quick overview of what we can expect in our session today. First of all, you might notice that I'm going to be over explaining things or as I would like to reframe it, I'm going to be very explicit and transparent, and that's very intentional. That's kind of built into our topic today of backward design and also transparency in learning and teaching. So we do this because we recognize that we all come from different backgrounds, different familiarity levels with our technology and tools that we're going to use on Zoom and Canvas as well. And some of us are going to be revising a course that we've already taught, while others might be working, scrambling to prepare for a course for the first time. We all have different access needs, whether or not we identify as disabled. We're going to go through and be very explicit about different accessibility techniques that we can provide for all of our students, regardless of their disability status. And so that's a little bit of an explanation of why we are trying to be as explicit about what we're doing as possible. So for this session, again, we will be looking at backward design and transparency in learning and teaching, two frameworks that we are using to get us started in our course design process. So we're hoping to demonstrate some active learning tools you probably are familiar with, but if not, that's totally fine too. We're going to be looking at some Zoom features. Many of us are teaching in person again, and maybe not on Zoom. However, you can still incorporate this in the classroom and if office hours, if you're doing that virtually still, hopefully you can practice or take advantage of some of these. We're also going to get started by meeting some students, and we want you to consider the students' identities and backgrounds. As we go through the Institute, you'll get to know a little bit more about them, and we ask you to kind of keep all of these different identities in mind as we proceed. You'll also notice I try to challenge myself to slow down and describe images used, and you'll meet a student in just a moment that kind of highlights why this is important. Great, thanks, Christian. Next slide. So I'm going to drop a link in the chat here that introduces you to these five students that we see here. We have various ages, gender and racial identities. One student's wearing an arm cast, another's wearing glasses, and another one is wearing scrubs and identifies as a little bit older than our more traditional quote unquote students. So again, as I mentioned, we're going to get to know them over the course of the Institute. But for now, I'm just going to give you a couple minutes to quickly read their profiles just so we know a little bit about them. So I'll give you a moment or two.
So if you're still reading, that's okay. But I wanted to get our first kind of active learning going with the annotate feature on Zoom. So you've probably used this before, but if not, we've got some guides at the top of this slide directing you to use the annotate feature. I ask that you would hear which student or maybe students, several of them, you feel some sort of connection with. That could be shared interests or motivations. Perhaps some of the, you might share some similar struggles or life experiences, but when you are finished reading, if you could go ahead and use the annotate feature, you can either draw a little, I don't know, you could draw something by the student, like a circle, or you can also use the stamp feature and just put a stamp by a student or several who you feel some sort of connection with. Great. That's interesting to see. So what we'll be doing again is considering the strengths and struggles of these five individuals and keeping that in mind that this is just a microcosm of the students in your classroom. We want to consider all of this when we go to make decisions about our course design. Awesome. Thanks, Christian. We can go to the next slide. So let's begin with a thought experiment. So whichever student or students that you maybe just annotated, you felt some connection with, this is great because in about five years from now, we're having you imagine bumping into the student and they still remember your course very fondly five years after they took it. And they still remember several key takeaways from your course. So what we're going to have you do is consider for a moment, what are the two or three things that you hope that students will remember from your course five years from now? So you can jot this down in your vision guide. And oh yeah, great, great idea, Chris, get to know the students, preterm survey. Awesome way to get to know them more. So in your participation guide at the bottom of page one, you can jot down a couple of things you hope students remember. If you want to have kind of a clean copy that you're working on that's private, you can just make a copy by going to file in your Google Doc. If not, if you kind of want to work collaboratively and see what others are writing, you can just use the link that's provided. So it'll give you a couple minutes to fill that in. I love watching people type in Google Docs when they're not logged in. So you see anonymous hamster, anonymous kiwi. <laughs>
So there's no rush if you're still writing. But once you're ready, if you could pop one thing that you help students remember from your course in the chat, that would be great. So we can see as a group. So we've got analyze the cultural values at stake in any representation. Bilingual speakers are not two monolinguals in one person. Ooh, I like that. Always wear your ethno ethnologist glasses. I like that. And we had an inclusive classroom and everyone was helping each other to learn in a fun yet thorough way. Ah, I like this. This is kind of the, they remember the learning community that you cultivated five years ago. Yeah, that's fantastic. So you can keep writing. I would encourage you to jot this down because we will come back to it. But we'll move on. And just as a reminder, we're designing or prepping for our courses. We want to do so in such a way that students are able to meet these awesome goals and outcomes that you've shared in the chat. So next slide. Great. So when we start designing a course, where do we begin? Traditional course design is often what we would consider instructor centered with the question driving course design being what do I need to do so often, especially if you're a first time instructor got to write that syllabus that's the first thing you do. Then the next step is prepare lecture the activities that you want to do in class, then you write the exams those learning outcomes are kind of the last thought and what we find ourselves kind of inevitably saying by following this course design framework we often hear instructors say well i don't have time to x y and z i don't have time for students to kind of really dig into their own individual interests or i don't really have time to have them work in groups because that kind of slows down the course for a bit if we do some active learning and we have so much content to get through and this is kind of an indication that your course may be content driven and there's nothing wrong with that we've got lots of awesome content that students do need to get through especially if they're going to proceed with their major have courses that are depending on their kind of attaining this foundational knowledge in your course but we also want to see if we can kind of reframe this a bit to be more student-centered and I'm looking over traditionally lit professors begin with a list of texts or materials student needs to know. Yes, exactly. So you've got all of this. This is in the textbook or we have to cover this canon in order to kind of teach the, the right type of literature course or whatever it is. Yeah, definitely. And again, there's nothing wrong with highlighting kind of those key works that students will need to get through. But what we propose instead is kind of reframing this so we can move to our next slide and rather than a kind of a linear course design method that we saw on this last side slide we propose backward design and this kind of starts with the why of learning instead of the what and we do this by carefully articulating our course learning outcomes first so if we look at this image we see the three cyclic arrows forming a loop 
with the learning goals as our destination, connecting to assessments, and then on to instruction and activities, and then back to our original of learning goals. So this is going to have us consider how students can demonstrate learning and achievement of our learning goals through the assessments and the instructional activities that we design. So in order to get Kaylee, Alex, Flo, Tim, and John, those students that we just met, to their learning goals, kind of the destination, design is really foregrounding ways that we can have them get to that destination. All right, next slide. So if we look at this kind of in steps, the first step of backward design is really articulating the intended learning outcomes we have for our students. What do they need to know and understand or be able to do by the end of this semester or the quarter, sorry, <laughs> by the end of the course? Then our second step is to identify how we plan to assess learners on their knowledge and mastery of the skills that we need them to demonstrate in order to say, yes, they've met those learning outcomes. So we have to determine proficiency levels and the kind of evidence that we'll deem acceptable for that achievement. And then finally, the last step is to plan learning experiences that promote achievement. So think about the learning activities that will help students be able to demonstrate their achievement of these learning goals and kind of goes into this, this cycle that we see here again on the right. We've got Chris saying, some teachers leave a space or two in learning goals section of the syllabus and invite students to write their own learning goals for the course. Yes, I really like that. So students kind of taking ownership of some of their learning, kind of taking control of that, that's fantastic. And then just as a last note here, when we look at this kind of cycle, it really is an iterative process. So we reflect on, we improve, we repeat. Again, always foregrounding those learning goals. All right, next slide. So unlike traditional course planning, backward design is what we would call student-centered and leads with the questions, what do students need to learn and how can we guide them to that learning? So those goals that we had you look at and start drafting a little bit of for students to remember five years from now, design kind of foregrounds the desired destination so that we can help students navigate towards that. This is done through alignment, which we will look at shortly. So we definitely advocate for backward design here at SEALS and sorry, no, at EPIC, but also at SEALS, at CAT, at the different learning centers here at UCLA but it's also quite prominent in the scholarship of teaching and learning. So lots of studies have been done to show its effectiveness. You'll also see reference to backward design at a lot of different university centers for teaching and learning. So don't just take our word for it. We are posting some resources you can check out in Brew and Learn if you would like to kind of further investigate its history and other applications. But for just one quick example for our next slide, you will see different charts and worksheets that can kind of help you organize your course goals and then the assessments and the learning activities. So this is one by Jay Matai, who is kind of credited as one of the big names in backward design development. He has this book that he co-authored called Understanding by Design. So we do have a link to an editable version of this table if you're interested. And there are lots of different iterations of this, but for us right now, we'll just stick to a simpler version. Next slide. That simply kind of charts out our goal. And so for, for us, we're just going to simply start by looking at the goal and outcome, and we'll differentiate between those in a moment, but kind of whatever it is that that goal that we have for our student learning. We then want to look at how we can have assessments that are aligned with this. So what assessments will help us figure out whether or not students have met this goal. And then finally, this next piece in red activities. So learning activities that will help get students to where they need to be when they go to do the assessment that will then show that they did achieve this kind of learning goal or outcome. 
So we can see some alignment here and I'll just read a couple different examples that we have for you. So our learning goal or outcome, students will develop an effective learning or sorry, an effective thesis statement. How are we gonna assess that? Well, then students will write a draft thesis statement that clearly states their position that is supported by evidence, is appropriate for the assignment and answers the question, so what? And what activities can help students get there? Each student will write their draft thesis statement on a sheet of paper, then they will exchange theirs with a partner. Each pair will then provide feedback on the other's draft. So that's one example. Next slide. Here are ones that I've used in my courses. So we've got the goal of having students evaluate how public attitudes towards HIV AIDS has changed since the New York Times first reported on a rare cancer seen in 41 homosexuals in 1981. So how can I assess that they've met that? Well, students will write a blog post explaining changes in social and cultural anxieties reflected in popular media discussions around HIV AIDS over the past four decades. What activities can I design to then help students be able to demonstrate this. Students will view and compare and contrast four different HIV AIDS themed Saturday Night Live sketches from a collection that I've provided from the 1980s all the way to the 2010s. So that's one example. And then another example I have right here on the next slide. This one I really like because that goal outcome can sound very difficult unless I break it down with the assessment and activities. So I've had a general goal for students to consider how gender shapes science, technology, and medicine, and inversely, how science, technology, and medicine shapes notions of gender. So an assessment, how I can actually see whether or not they're thinking kind of along the lines I'd like them to. Students will critically examine how traditional narratives of conception, so this warrior sperm wins the egg, how this reflects gender disparity in STEM. And then an activity I can get them to do to help show this mastery of knowledge. Students can revise or reinvent a birds and bees story by drafting a short illustrated children's book to reflect cryptic female choice, which is great. This says that the egg actually has agency over which sperm she chooses, in vitro fertilization or other forms of family making. Yeah, so these are just a couple of examples of alignment that we've actually used in our courses. So we're going to ask you to do something quite similar in just a moment. What we want to have you do, next slide please, Christian, is think of this Rubik's cube. So alignment kind of is like this cube and that we want all of the sides to finally fit together. So this shows how the components of backward design, so the learning outcomes, assessments, and the activities hopefully should seamlessly work together in aligning our courses. So a few other things to consider before we have you try this out. Sometimes when we go to write these learning outcomes or goals, we might find ourselves using the same verbs over and over again, and that's very common. Sometimes this language is rather vague, so we want students to understand or know or remember. And that's okay, but one way we can kind of tackle this is looking at Bloom's taxonomy. This has been around for a while, but it's a pyramid that shows different, like we've got at the bottom, these are considered lower order kind of cognitive tasks that we have students do. First, we can have them remember facts. The next level up is understand them. All the way up, we're applying, analyzing, evaluating, and finally creating so at that top here is considered kind of the higher order cognitive skills. And it's good for us to consider where we want our learning goals to land in this pyramid. So I think a good mixture is always good over the course of a quarter. So students will need, oh, we're getting, I literally already have Bloom's taxonomy open in the next window. Uh, yeah, I had, I had an image of Bloom's taxonomy a couple of years ago on my desktop and I actually had a student say, why do you have that just randomly on your desktop? It's good to have it easily accessible. And so this is kind of how it's arranged. We've seen new updated iterations of it and that's fine, whichever resource you find helpful. 
But what we do like to kind of consider is what are some other words, maybe more precise than the ones that we see here in our pyramid on the left. This can help you kind of consider how to craft some of your learning goals and objectives. So we'll take another moment to using the annotate feature. If you can come up with another word or two that you could challenge yourself to use slightly more precise than some that are kind of on this pyramid, you can write it by the pyramid level you think it might go next to, or you can just kind of type it wherever. But we'll just take a moment or two to generate a few extra words you can also write this on your participant guide. It was at the top of page two, but I realized that as we have people type, I think the page numbers might adjust, but you'll see an image of the pyramid right next to it. Great, we already see some compare and develop. Excellent, and I think that those, yeah, that's well-situated kind of middling cognitive levels. Operate, employ, awesome. Examine, expose, reveal, produce, challenge. Yeah, definitely. I like the question mark <laughs> challenge. Yeah, we could be asking them to challenge an argument, challenge assumptions, assess. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm blind here. List, name, recall. Yep. Those are all, again, really well aligned with this pyramid, I think. Summarize. Sure, so you can jot down some of these. We also have a link on Brew and Learn that has lots of different verbs. We can go on to the next slide and see some other examples as well. Great. And yes, Elise, you might actually have a different iteration of this. I don't know if it looks just like this or if it's slightly different. You'll see lots of these out here or out there, but this can be one tool that can be helpful. Oh, wow. <laughs> Laurence has her inverted. Oh, that's great. Do you notice any other differences? It puts create as the most important, like almost like to, to remind you that the end is the most important. And this one I like because it has questions. How can mm -hmm. I innovate? What can you innovate? Invent? I like that. Mm -hmm. And it, it has the idea of what, what is teacher-led, what is student-centered. So I find it very helpful. I have it in my fashion. I have a notebook where I prepare my lesson plan or put ideas. So mm -hmm. I have it there. And I also have this, which a bunch of verbs connected to that. Anyway. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Maybe I'll, I'll look for that inverted one too. Yeah, and if you find any resources, feel free to send them along and we can also post them on the, the Brew and Learn page so that we can kind of crowdsource our, our different expertise and awesome things that we find. Great, thanks so much for sharing that. All right, so for the next slide. What we'll look at is this distinction that we've made a few times but haven't quite explored it. This is the distinction between goals and then learning outcomes. Now before I really get into this, I do want to save a little bit of time hopefully at the end of this where we can unpack this, we can push back, we can argue, that's totally fine. Ultimately I don't think what we call them particularly matters. So we've decided to say goals are kind of these overarching broad things that we have for our students that are often a little bit more difficult to measure than learning outcomes. So that's why we say the smart kind of specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, timely outcomes. Then you also can throw everything into chaos by adding in the word objectives and saying, oh, how, how does that kind of fit into this? You might find it worded slightly differently in the literature, but what we just kind of underscore, regardless of what you call it, 
I think it's good to have these kind of broad goals for students. And then it's also really good to break those down, maybe by unit or by skill that you're having them develop or something that are going to be more specific, maybe a little bit easier for you to assess whether or not the students have reached them. So for our example, it's a very classic example for SMART outcomes. Let's say you want to lose some weight. That could be your goal. Okay, but what's specific? Well, I want to reach a healthy BMI. That's a specific weight. It's measurable by saying, I want to lose X amount of pounds to reach that healthy BMI. How achievable is it to just say you want to lose 50 pounds? That can seem overwhelming. Well, I want to average a loss of one to two pounds each month until I reach that healthy BMI. Is it relevant? Yes, I want to feel healthier and also fit into my favorite outfit again. So it's it's a relevant goal to me. And is it timely? I want to do this by December 31st. So this is just an example that's not content related, but we can kind of take the same approach with these smart learning outcomes in our alignment table. So what we'll do is take a, a few minutes. Oh, let's see. I know this is not what we're talking about here, but BMI is not a good correlate of health outcomes. Healthy BMI is not a real thing. Thank you. Yes, and this depends on lots of different factors as well. So hopefully you can make a more relevant goal for yourself. Definitely. So what we'll, what we'll have you do is take a few minutes to if we go on to the next slide. You'll see how we've arranged this. Oh, one second, Chris, I'll explain this. And then definitely, I, I know that you do have lots of good stuff to kind of weigh in with. So we're going to have you do this activity where you can come up with a couple learning goals. For this activity, you'll just do one. So one learning goal, and then see how you can convert that into a smart learning outcome. So our example here, Students will understand that science is socially constructed and impacts all facets of society. That's great. I hope they do, but I need to break that down a little bit more so I can see whether or not they understand. Students will consider how gender shapes science, technology, and medicine, and inversely, how science, technology, and medicine shapes notions of gender. I can continue to break this down even further and more measurable, but I've given myself something a little bit more concrete here. So before we send you off to work on this, yes, I definitely want to turn this over to, to Chris. Thank you. I was wondering about the specificity in our learning goals, how specific we want to make that first goal. For example, if we go back, and you don't need to do this by the slides, but if we go back to my field, which is composition, and you talk about an effective thesis, you then have as part of the assessment in the second one, what I would use to define what it, because the students will sometimes come to me and go, what do you mean by effective? And you have there now compelling use of evidence or it's a bold claim or something like that. So when we're composing these learning goals, like how much detail is too much in the learning goal right off the bat and how much is actually quite helpful both to the student and to myself as I'm designing these learning activities, the more specific in my head, I can go like, oh, well, an effective thesis is one that's debatable. So the activity I'm going to create is debate. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I want to open it up to others. Any Thoughts? One way that I, I've done it in the last maybe like year or so is that I have some mostly the learning goals in my syllabus and maybe a couple of big that's specific to the major assignments or especially if it's like a writing course or something like that or if it's a capstone where they have to do a research project. I add that to the kind of list of maybe four learning outcomes that I have or learning goals that I have in my syllabus. And then what I do is when I break down some of the major assignments, I add it on the assignment prompt and then kind of let them know that these are aligned with our original learning goals, kind of keep going back to the syllabus. And so I'm able to break it down further in the actual assignment prompt that I'm giving them. Yeah, that's great. 
Anyone else? I think there's, yeah, lots I'm of gonna, different ways to approach this. Yeah, they're all. Awesome. Yeah, I'm going to jump in very fast. Also, I think Alisa's idea is great because I found also if you give too much to students, they feel completely overwhelmed because mm -hmm. they, they, they think they have to do everything and they don't understand it's more like a roadmap for us and not like, oh my gosh, if I didn't get this, 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 then that's that's it. I'm doomed, you know? So there's mm -hmm. the, I, I'm with Chris. There's a fine balance here just, just for the sake of the student. There is. And I think I've noticed a change in how I go about writing my outcomes and goals. I think I think you will evolve and and change it just depending on lots of different things. Sometimes, yeah, I don't want learning to be a checklist. Sometimes it takes into account, like I keep some broad goals and then the outcomes are going to change depending on who's in my classroom. So you might have these like, oh yeah, all the students are going to come in and we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And then maybe that's not actually the group that I get dealt. I don't mean that in a bad way, but like, oh, actually their interests are over here. I didn't know that until I got to know some of my students, I can adjust. So yeah, I mean, I think this is a, is a great question. For some of the goals, I might think of it as like more transferable skills too. It might be slightly less tailored to the discipline or the field. And then the outcomes are kind of showing how we're practicing whatever historians do if it's a history class. But that's definitely not like one way. That's just one example of ways you could do it. But I don't think there's a right way to do it. But a fantastic question for us to keep in mind for sure. So what we'll do, I'm going to see how much time I've allotted this. Yeah. We're in good shape. So we'll, let's just do, we'll do five minutes. You're just going to do one goal and see if you can also either convert it into a smart learning outcome or kind of have the goal inspire a learning outcome that's slightly more specific, measurable, attainable, et cetera. So we'll do five minutes and then we'll, we'll check back in as a group. So bring you back at about 1051. So that's achievable. And then the relevant and the timely that was within the classroom, right? F 50 minutes. Relevant is after that, I had them think about how that could, how there's something similar in the US and we talk about town hall meetings and stuff like that and how that could be applied to the United States or Los Angeles more specifically. I don't know if that works, but that's kind of what I do. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And you kind of, you showed us kind of where with the, with the SMART acronym, you were making that more measurable and more concrete for students. Yeah, that's fantastic. We also have over in the chat, students will be able to compose insightful analyses of novels that make a bold claim about the cultural argument of the text. Practice finding evidence that relates to novels comment about arist aristocratic and racist belief in blood purity. Wow. Yeah, so they're going to be composing analyses and then practicing finding evidence. Fantastic. Great. So I also welcome, just because we have a couple minutes, I welcome Chris or Jennifer who were, oh, awesome. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely be kind of looking at these further throughout the Institute as we ask you to do more and more with these learning outcomes. But Jennifer and Chris both had really great points at our kind of pre-ESI meeting last week about kind of learning outcomes and, and goals and way slight tweaks and ways that we could reframe it or rephrase it to perhaps get even more kind of concrete goals from students. So I welcome, but no pressure. I can give an example by reframing the two that I have, where I have the end goal, 
and then the practice that will allow that is one of the difficulties that teachers in training have found in my practice is aligning the goals and the activities and the assessments. And so we've asked them to do something that we call goal combining. It's like sentence combining, only they would kind of reverse it. So if I take the one that I post about students will be able to, I would actually start with by practicing finding evidence and then blah, 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 blah. Students will be able to. So I've actually had, I, I put my cause the activity becomes a causal relationship to the practice finding. Let me just spell that correctly. Students will be able to compose and so on. Okay, let me do it. So this is, uh, I'm just going to leave it because <laughs> I type horrible. No, no, so, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a guarantee of alignment. You actually, in, in composing the goal, you are aligning the activities and by inference, the assessment with the goal. And then students can see very clearly the path, right? Because they're, they see that one path has a causal link with the outcome. And so that's the logic that we're trying to get our students to understand is we're asking you to do this because it will lead you to this thing. It will help you to produce this outcome that we have desired. So that's one way that we're tweaking the writing of the goals these days. No, I love that. And it's a really great segue into what we'll we'll do right after our short break, because I think that that's also adding some transparency. It's kind of telling students, I'm having you do this thing because it's going to help you get to demonstrating this knowledge. So I think that's fantastic. And Jennifer, I don't, I think that you had something quite similar to that. Do you want to elaborate or... Does Chris, did Chris kind of cover it? Sorry, I thought my camera was on. Well, I think last week seems so long ago, but I think what I was thinking when, when we were talking about this, it, it reminded me of the, the XY thing. It reminded me, it's a little bit different, but you know what Google calls the XYZ resume form. And so I think that, so kind of like using this, but also framing it in ways that students can then kind of take that also and apply it to their future life. But I think I really like that measurable. I think that's really useful. And the and what Chris said, I totally agree with, you know, so yeah, I don't really have anything new to add. No, awesome. No, I think, yeah, bringing up the Google XYZ, I don't know much about that, but I want to look into it. But yeah, it sounds like it also kind of brings in like, real world like this. This is also how it helps you in the real world, which is always fabulous to highlight for students as well. Great. Well, thank you so much. We're going to have you refer back to these, expand on these. So thanks everyone for getting started on this. What we're going to do now is take a quick break. So we'll do a 10 minute break and be ready for our next section, which is going to look at Transparency in Learning and Teaching with Lisa at 1110. So have a good break and see you soon. Thank you for recording. Okay, so what is TILT? It's Transparency in Teaching and Learning, and it is in a teaching approach where expectations, goals, and methods of assessment are made explicitly clear to the students. Next slide, please. To adapt this transparent teaching method is to articulate directly to students the purpose of the learning experiences they will encounter throughout the term, both during and after class time. And so the after class time part is kind of homework assignments that they're doing, project that they're doing outside of your time with them in the classroom. This includes making visible to them the transferable skills that they'll be practicing in the course as well. This method can aid the entire course design process because it requires instructors to be intentional 
about providing design, providing students with the rationale behind why you've chosen the course content, the specific course content that you're you're covering, the, the rationale behind the assessment techniques and what they're actually assessing, and the activities, the, the kind of active learning activities that you do, and how these choice sales will get them to the learning goals that you articulate, either in your syllabus or in your kind of breaking down of learning outcomes in the various assignments and activities that you do in class. It also goes further by asking us as instructors to really talk to the students about the rationale even behind some of the outcomes that we're asking them to, to practice throughout the, the term. Next slide, please. Some strategies you can use to ensure your, your course, especially your assignment design or transfer or transparent include explaining assignment, assessment, learning goals, and rationales by providing students with an overview of the purpose of the assignment, a breakdown of the tasks they will need to complete, an explanation of the grading scheme or rubric prior to the deadline, and examples of successful assignments prior to the deadline as well. And I think this is key because TILT as a teaching and learning approach came about through kind of re revising assessment techniques, whether they're low stakes or high stakes. And there are several studies that they've done and we can send, we can add those this is on the Blue and Learn site where they really, they, they, they studied or they surveyed a, a lot of several courses across the country. It's a national study and they asked instructors to make one assignment or two, at least one or two assignments in the entire term more transparent to follow the, the kind of structure of talking about the purpose, talking about the tasks, and then giving them examples of of the assignments prior to the deadline and the rubric prior to the deadline. And they found that across the board, students feel much more engaged in the classroom. They feel a, a sense of belonging and that they're a part of the, the teaching and learning process. And it's really essentially a, a tool to ensure equity and inclusion in our practice. And so what I found compared to when I kind of gave an assignment, I gave a prompt, explained it, and then I gave them the rubric after I have graded the assignment so that they can understand the grade, I found that once I give them the rubric from the very beginning, they know what to look for and what kinds of, what, what kinds of ideas to make sure they show in their assignments. And it's, it's really worked wonders for, you know, getting students to understand the tasks that they have to do. Like I said, include students in, in, in planning the class and, and thinking about, well, perhaps we could, one way they actually did this during the pandemic, I was teaching in the winter last quarter or last, last winter when we were kind of going back and forth in our modalities. And in that back and forth, where we were kind of online at first, remote at first, and then in person, there was, I had a lot of assignments that were due. And so I was very transparent with them and I kind of said, I need to re-pivot the class back to in person. I'm gonna need another week. And because I need another, some extra time to do that, what I'll do is I'll give you one or two days to complete the assignment because all of us are going through the, this kind of flipping from, pivoting from remote to in-person and it really worked they really appreciated me being transparent with them and letting them know why i was doing some of the things that i was doing with them and it showed up in my evaluations as well as in my midterm survey that i did to this with the students so i was i was really happy including them into the planning and then fostering metacognition and growth mindset by giving them opportunities to reflect on their learning. And this is also a very important part of tilting. After an assignment is completed, allowing the students to reflect on their own or reflect with, with the class or reflect in a discussion board some of their triumphs and challenges as they were kind of completing the assignment and perhaps what they would like to do better next time around. Right. Yeah, it looks like Daria has a question about the rubric. Daria, I'm happy to read the question, or if you'd like to, you can, either way. Yeah, well, I can ask it. It's mostly kind of to find a nice balance. So I agree with rubric and everything should be rubric based. But then what I notice sometimes if I give students too much kind of 
knowledge into how exactly things are graded, they start focusing on those things. For example, if references are part of the assessment, then they will really focus on that and kind of forget the large picture. So do you have any I don't know, recommendations? It's probably like assessment specific and all of that. But like mm -hmm. if there are some general guidelines, how to think about that. So I try to hide points from them because I think it's confusing. They start focusing on that, like parking, looking at the little flags behind, like when you learn parking, instead of just trying to get a general feel of how to park. So if you have any recommendations of that one, because I'm, I'm always confused, what is the right way to think about it? Yes, thank you, Daria. This is a great question. And as Katie dropped in the in the chat, we'll be talking about rubrics and assessment specifically more tomorrow. But to answer just that, that question quickly is that what I like to tell my students, and I even add it on the on the rubric itself, I have like my personal rubric, right, where I really break it down for myself. And then I have one that I give to my students where it's kind of general, these are the things that I'll be looking for. And what I tell them is when I'm assessing this paper, for example, last time in your first paper, these are some of the skills that I really focused on. This time around, these are some of the skills that I'm going to focus on because I want to show them the, pro the progress from one assignment to another assignment to the final assignment, right? And so I, I want to, in showing that, that progress, I, I'm telling them that because this is the first paper, these are the things that I will focus on. And perhaps I may be a little bit more lenient in the first paper. And also I'm kind of trying to gauge my students' familiarity with the subject or, for, or, or comfortability with writing and, and, and what, what other else I'm trying to gain from that first assignment. And then in the second assignment or the third assignment, I tell them, okay, we've looked at some of these conventions in the first assignment. Now we're going to look at more, more your argument how you frame your 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 paragraphs if this is a writing course right and so i really emphasize in my explanation which skills i'm going to be looking at specifically for that it's not to say that they won't be applying the things that they've they've that they looked at in the first assignment and i tell them apply some of those things and then on top of that i'm going to these very specific parts of your paper or your assignment and again, we can, we'll talk about rubrics tomorrow. We'll go through all of some of the ways that we can create inclusive assessment techniques tomorrow. And I'm just going to look over the chat from Chris. We drop point values assigned to specific intellectual behaviors and invited students to focus on how they can improve those behaviors. Great. I had, had more sure. questions Thanks. about why I got a four rather than a five on that, on that category rather than focusing on how do I improve in that area? So we very much, as you said, both our rubrics and our feedback pedagogy began to involve more suggestions for improvements. Here is a way that you could get better at this thing, or okay, have you tried this? Have you thought of this kind of thing? So we're, we're moving towards feedback that is suggestive or interrogative, where we ask, what exactly are you trying to do when in this paragraph or with this claim that you're making? As I understand it, it's kind of, you're saying this, is that right? Is that really what you want to say? So that we're engaging either in interrogative dialogue with them, or we are making some kinds of suggestions, but trying to get them as far from like grades for each thing that they do or points for each, because those never work out anyway. Right, exactly. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so next slide, please. Going back to additional strategies, engage students in the grading criteria. And this is not to say that you, you allow them to create their own schema, right? <laughs> but to really let them know, I'm emphasizing this, that's why it's more worth more points because of A, B, and C. I'm emphasizing this because we're far enough into the quarter and you've you've shown some growth and so this is time to challenge you on these other ideas, right? And so kind of letting them know why you're grading them in, in those particular ways. Debrief assessments with them, which is part of the reflection part of TILT, which is really great. And I'm sure many of you are already reflecting with our students about how they feel they, they did in those in those assessments. 
And then finally, highlight thinking, questioning, and transferable skills that, that students demonstrated. And this was something that I really was very deliberate in, in my last course, talking about transferable skills, because I was teaching a capstone course, and I wanted to make sure that my students who are seniors and juniors can see that this literature course, this comparative literature course, will allow them to really be able to, the skills that they're, that they're learning from this literature course, will allow them to kind of be more critical, in not only in our course, but in their other courses as well as beyond, right? So I highlight to, with them some of the things that they've learned that doesn't have anything to do with the particular content. And actually, we had one activity where at the end of the classes, the closing activity, I had the students write the things that they learned in the course on their own on the board. And we saw it, we had a, a whole kind of, you know, we had a visual of it on the board and they filled it up. And a lot of them had nothing to do with the content of the course, but some, some of the skills that they feel they could use in their other courses as well as beyond LA. Okay, questions. What to do before evaluations do? They'll give more specific feedback. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Katie. And again, this is merely touching the, scratching the surface. Yes, Chris? I think I saw you. I just wanted to piggyback real quick on, on Katie's comment, because your practice is also marvelous for transforming student evaluation into a learning tool, right? <laughs> so now it becomes where oftentimes we found that student comments cover only the last from week eight to the finals it was the last two weeks that they remembered unless teachers went through a kind of review and asked exactly as you asked kind of like what do you remember that we did the first week and and was that significant to you and what are you carrying forward from third week and so then they began to get that review which is part of the consolidation of learning and then the evaluation process is not a Yelp review. We're trying to get them away from that mindset of Yelp review and exactly. get them back to the tilt. What tilt says is, hey, this is a dialogue. Learning is everybody in this classroom contributes and we all learn together. Let's find out what we learn. So I love what you did with having them contribute to a, filling the board with material and then say, Okay, now let's let's do the evaluations and talk about how effective things were and you can make suggestions for even more. Exactly, that's a really great suggestion. Especially now it's very difficult to get them to do the evaluations because at the end of quarter evaluations, I should say, because it's all online. And so this really jogs their memory and they're able to then hopefully give you constructive feedback in your end of quarter evaluations. Thank you. Okay, so like I mentioned, we will likely offer a tilt workshop this summer. I mean, this this summer, <laughs> summer is almost over. This 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 year, and so please look out for that because this is merely kind of scratching the purpose. But if you remember one thing with this, in terms of the philosophy of tilt, is purpose, task, criteria. You tell the students the purpose of activity. You give them their tasks in a kind of step-by-step -step process so they know what they need to have on hand so that they can finish the assignment. And then criteria obviously is sharing with them and being transparent about the rationale behind how you're going to be evaluating that assessment tool. Okay, great. So let's start with our next activity. And Daria added something in the chat, self-reflection plus this paper, week nine for evals. Great, oh, I'm looking forward to checking this out later on in our break. Thank you, Daria. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to drop a link on the chat just now. And in one second, Tegan is going to put you in breakout rooms. And in, in that PDF, you'll see two versions of a book assignment, one that's more transparent and one that's less transparent. And you're going to compare and contrast with your small group the differences between these versions of the assignment. And then you're going to discuss how the updated version increased transparency and in what ways. 
And then also discuss in your small groups how much information is enough or helpful versus excessive and overwhelming. Again, this is that part where we want to give them just enough information so that they're able to successfully finish the assignment, but we don't want to overwhelm, right? So where is that balance? And let's discuss in our smaller groups. And so give us one moment. Tegan, if you can stop recording now so you can go ahead and start. But Oh, thank you, Tegan. But let's start with the, the, the kind of debrief. What did you all talk about in your groups? And what was helpful in this comparison? And any other kind of points that you discussed that you'd like to share? Can I make a meta comment about that? Sure. I really fall in the shoes of my students when I, we still wanted to go over something that we've just talked about in the main room. Then we're like, where is the link? Then, okay, we have to focus on the assignment now. Then, okay, quickly start going through the thing. So we went through half of the instruction and then, oh, it's already time to get out. So I think that realizing just how fast that goes is like, and also like a very useful reminder for breakout room ethics or I don't know, like planning and, and what is actually reasonable. So yeah. Yes, thank you, Daria. And of course, we have lots of things that we have to talk about and want to discuss. And this will not be the first time we'll have to cut off a discussion short. I, I will, I will be honest, but we will try as best as we can to make sure you have enough time to discuss. And also, we do want to make sure that at the end of each session, we have time to get you for this session. And this, and we'll do it within the session so that we can make improvements for the next time we offer the Institute. But thank you so much. And yes, we'll try to, be, we'll try to keep to the time as possible and, and allowing you all to have more elaborate conversations. Okay, so. Which group would like to share? Oh, oh. We're saying call on people's name because it's always the same people that jump in. <laughs> <laughs> I want to model waiting time I'm because I'm so terrible at waiting. <laughs> like, okay, no one after 10 seconds. Okay, this person. So now that we've waited for a bit, I'm going to call, let's see, Gabriel. Is it Gabriel or Gabriel? Either is fine, but Gabriel, I'd say. Yeah, we uh, we talked about the, comparing the two versions. We were looking at the instructions. Obviously, for the the more transparent revised version, version the instructions were much more 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 detailed and clear. And also, just in the way they were written, the tone seemed more inviting to whoever's reading that assignment and less sort of mechanical and uh, as in the first version. So those were some of the things we talked about. Also, I think we thought it was uh, when we were moving through the assignment and the space that was added in the more transparent version following the questions giving sort of an example of what of what you know the what you're looking for what the what the assignment is actually calling for seemed to be helpful those are just a few of the things that came up in the in our conversation great and maybe somebody else from your group what about the more transparent assignment clued you in on the different tone like what words or what phrasings made the tone different from the the less transparent one one thing I noticed, I was in Gabriel's group. One thing I noticed was that the learning outcomes were really formal in the less transparent version. And then they were kind of translated into really kind of concrete, easy to understand skills in the other one. And I, I would appreciate that as a student. Great, awesome, thank you. Any other thoughts from that group? Yeah. Also, in the questions, even though the, the activity questions or the task questions are very similar, the, the addition of the boxes where it says like an effective answer will include, that also really points students in a very concrete direction because otherwise I might be like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Good point. Thank you. Other groups. Maybe we'll take two more comments. If I may jump like piggyback on this by giving this little box by saying an effective response, it also forces you to make sure that you actually can come up with an answer, that your question is clear enough that you yourself can do the assignment. So 
Great. And sometimes when I think about tilting an assignment, I think of it as the student view of Bruin Learn or, or Canvas or CCLE, right? Because I know all of the things. So if I do a student version, <laughs> will if will I as a student be able to follow these instructions, be able to get to be able to complete the assignment? And so I try to do that example for my or that that exercise for myself. And maybe last comment until we move on. Chris, yes, please, thank you. It because we bring up issue of kind of providing examples or samples to students as a way of helping. And I think the literature has shown that that helps to clarify your expectations for students when you can provide examples. But what I've learned recently is it's even more helpful if you include examples that have your comments and your feedback appended to them. So students can kind of go like, oh, well, I see what you saw was strong about this thing. Now I understand what I need to emphasize in my own work. That if you just provide a sample, sometimes they're like piranha. They will just start attacking it. And you go, no, this is an A paper. <laughs> go settle down, you know? <laughs> but providing the, the feedback that you have provided to that student really helps them to get a better understanding of your expectations. Great. And what's what's actually nice about that is if you can use previous students and of course anonymized and having already asked those group of students permission to use snippets of their work to share with other students. And then if I don't have that, if it's an entirely new assignment altogether, what I'll do is I'll do the assignment and then I'll comment <laughs> as myself. I play the student and the teacher. I'll add my own comments to that assignment to show the students that oh, by the way, these are some of the things that you may expect me to comment on, right? So, but I don't, I don't do a whole paper, just a snippet, because that all takes too much time, but, but yes, thank you, Chris. Okay, any last questions, comments? Okay, Katie, I'll pass it on to you now. Great, do we wanna do the, yeah, we've got some time. So we'll do one quick more activity where we'll have you, let me share the screen again. What you're gonna do is take those learning goals or outcomes. So hopefully you've drafted one or gotten a good start on one at least. What we'll do is then have you add on to that one let's do one more next slide oh sorry the next one with the table there we go so what we'll, what we want to do is add on to this one more one tilt intervention that you could consider linking on to your learning goal or outcome so my example kind of going back to what we've talked a little bit about students will understand that science and technology is socially constructed and impacts all facets of society my example for some tilt interventions the first is whenever students' questions or discussions sound like they're reflecting this concept of technological determinism, technology decides everything, I will just point out this line of thought and label it for them so that they come to understand what that, what kind of uh, reasoning they're using. And then another one is use their own real life experiences with science and technology, social media, gaming, whatever it is that they're interested in and have that uh, as part of their engagement. So we'll give you a couple of minutes to think of some, some tilt interventions you could implement. We do have a link that we can also drop with some other ideas if you need some inspiration. We'll give you a couple of minutes to do that, and then we will bring you back for our survey. All right. So again, you can work directly on your student or your participant guide, or if you wanted to keep a, a private one, you can do that as well. And then here are some examples of tilt interventions. So I'll give you about five minutes for this. So we will keep coming back to this table. So you're not you're not quite done with it, but for for now, we can move on. What we want to do, and Christian, if you could go to the next slide, I will pop the link to our feedback form. 
in the chat, if you could take a few minutes to give us some feedback, we would appreciate that. Thank <clears throat> you. 